Welcome back to another episode of the COVID debate with TNIE. In this episode, TNI editor G.S. Vaso gets talking to Dr. Rahul Potluri, a consultant cardiologist with Kim's Hospital in Hyderabad and who also works with the NHS in the UK. He's a senior clinical lecturer at Aston Medical School and is a very well-known voice across the shores. We asked him what he thought about the effect of heat on the coronavirus and we also managed to ask him why the UK didn't social distance initially and also about how long this quarantine is going to last. This is what he had to say. You are currently practicing both in the UK and India. Uh, is That's there correct. any difference in the approach towards dealing with the coronavirus? There are a number of differences initially um, in the way that the corona situation has been handled in both the UK and India. Initially, when the first cases came on in the UK, uh, the policy was to test all of those that were came into contact with the initial cases and the initial after this they thought they were in control okay. a few weeks later they found out that uh, community spread was happening without a an isolated index case of foreign travel mm. and subsequently they thought that they could not handle the extent of the community spread and so they came up with an idea of herd immunity this is how they Uh, managed the situation in the UK for a good two to three weeks in late February, early March. It was only then that they calculated that 60% of the population would need to be affected if the herd immunity concept was correct, and which would have resulted in about a quarter of a million deaths. So they subsequently changed the policy in line with the rest of the world, um, where they were going for the social isolation and lockdown policy. In India, the situation was much more different. Initially, the cases were not as much, or certainly they were not tested as much. And the focus primarily was that this was a this is a foreign disease uh, brought in by foreigners, and the degree of community spread is not known even till now. What is not different now is the concept of social isolation and lockdown. Both countries advocate social distancing lockdown and restricted movement. And the reason for that is, A, is to reduce the spread of the coronavirus from person to person. If people don't move around and have interactions with each other, the chance of spread is significantly reduced. And particularly if they follow this for two to three weeks, uh, the exponential spread can be stopped somewhat. But they have to adhere to this social distancing um, To at least 75% of the population has to adhere and as close to 100% will result in a better outcome. The second reason for the social distancing is to buy some time for the healthcare system so that they can cope with the outbreak. Uh, when I mean buy some time, initial modeling performed in the West and particularly in Europe and in the US have shown that if Everybody gets the virus in the space of a couple of weeks. No matter how good the healthcare system is, they won't be able to cope. Just to give you a bit, little bit of on numbers, in the UK, there are around 6,000 ventilators in the healthcare system in the whole country. If even with the social distancing, the peak outbreak in a couple of weeks, it's estimated they will need 30 to 40,000 ventilators, which is fivefold more than the number of ventilators they have. Oh. So this is the concept of, uh, uh, you know, um, ensuring that the healthcare system can cope with the extent of the disease outbreak. And what they're trying to do, another reason for the social distancing is so that the number of sick cases can be spread over a period of time so that the demand the ventilators can be met. So in hindsight, uh, 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 is it reasonably safe to conclude that the measure that India took of imposing a complete lockdown was a better option than what the West did in the context of what you said about what UK did first and then resorted to a lockdown after they realized that one third of the population is likely to get affected? We have to congratulate the Indian government for taking this step. Um, they now... Uh, have to go further to ensure that uh, the lockdown is fully adhered to and 
make no mistake, the only point that should come out of this interview, if nothing else, is that social distancing and lockdown right, to be adhered by as many people as possible, as close to 100% as possible, will limit um, the that spread of this disease and will also enable the healthcare system to cope. So India must be congratulated on the fact that they've put this lockdown um, uh, implemented this lockdown at an early stage compared to some countries in the West. At some point, but this has to be lifted, right? And people will be back on the street. The government at least clarified that it has no plan to continue it beyond three weeks. Will we be safer by then without the risk of virus affecting us? Or do you suspect that the virus will be back? There is a lot of uncertainty as to when these lock- this lockdown can be lifted. And if we look at multiple arguments as to the reasons and uh, contra- and the uh, problems with the lockdown. A lot of the arguments based are public health versus economic. For yeah. example, in the U.S. last week, 3.2 million people were made unemployed in one week, which is a record. I think the previous record before that was 600,000 back in 1929. So you can understand the, con- and the stark economic um, uh, issues that many countries, not only in the West, but also in Asia, are facing. If the health is not safe and if people cannot go out about their daily business, for example, go to a shop without being scared that they'll catch a virus, there is no economy. So the concept that the lockdown is going to cause economic harm, so therefore the lockdown should be lifted before the public health and before the virus is completely beaten, is a misnomer. The lockdown can be lifted the sooner rather than later, if people adhere to the policies, if the virus numbers remain low, if the number of deaths are not vastly increasing, and if the healthcare system can cope with the capacity that it has with the number of new cases coming without uh, being at full capacity or beyond. And if all of these happen, then certainly the lockdown can be lifted, but not before that. What do you think is a reasonable time when we can conclude uh, that India is free from a possible community spread? I think uh, your question is a very good one, and it, it, it's got multiple answers. Uh, the reason being that the number of being pe- people being tested in India is, is low. We can't say that there is no community spread if people who are well and uh, in the community are not being tested, and they have to be tested in the thousands. So one of the misnomer about coronavirus is that the West, or particularly the U.S., has a lot more cases compared to countries where there are only a few thousand cases. Um, but certainly in the U.S., they have tested at about a million people so far. We have nowhere close tested a million people in India. So if we have tested vast number of people in the community and the number of positive cases are not high, then certainly we can come to that conclusion that there is no community spread. When we have not tested, we cannot come to that conclusion that there is no community spread. And this is the policy not only underlined, and not only are my thoughts, but it's also underlined by the WHO policy, where they are advocating test, 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 as you know. But even in regard to testing, there are two theories that are being propagated, right? One is test, test, and test. While what we seem to be currently doing, at least in India, is only to test those showing symptoms. Which one would you sail with? There are two things, and I think you have to do both. The reason that you're only testing the people with symptoms is in a country of 1.3 billion people. Um, Are you going to test anyone, everyone? We know even the U.S., particularly in the first two to three weeks, had difficulty in obtaining the testing equipment. Uh, Now things have eased slightly there. Many countries across the world, including the U.K., are having difficulties in obtaining the testing equipment. And by no means is it a different story in India. So lack of testing equipment is one of them. Second thing is, what are you going to do if you test somebody and they come positive? Are you going to isolate all of them, all millions of them? There's no capacity to do so. The second thing is, when we come out of it on the other side, how do we know who is infected and who is not? If you don't have such an exit strategy, All the things we have talked about, such as economy, health, nobody knows. So then a different type of a test is required. Not only a test as to who's got the virus, but also a test for who 
has had the virus and are immune. There are two arguments being made and both of them have turned sort of controversial. Mm -hmm. One, the virus that traveled to India is less virulent. This is one theory that we are hearing. And then there is this study reportedly presented by MIT professionals that the virus may not survive in hot conditions. Is there enough, uh, enough scientific data to bear back these claims? I'm aware of both of these studies and I must say that both of these are very preliminary studies and the first study that you mentioned with regards to the MIT paper looking at temperature and the mm. coronavirus, that is only an abstract that was presented. Uh, there is no full paper of that. And certainly the abstract is somewhat peer-reviewed, but not to the extent that a full paper would be. So that's the first caveat. And the second caveat is they looked at the cases that were present in early, mid-March, and they correlated this to temperatures. It's purely computational model with correlation. They themselves claim that they cannot, uh, by any circumstances, uh, conclude that coronavirus will not uh, be affected in hot, humid countries. It remains to be seen if temperature has an effect on the coronavirus, but certainly this is not what uh, this study has shown. The analogy to this is, that if you go out in the night sky and you look at the stars in the moon and you suddenly come to that conclusion that the moon is bigger than the stars because the moon is closer to us, that's not the right analogy. And certainly because the coronavirus started in colder places and then spread to other colder places and the hotter places such as Africa, Asia, it's only now coming to spread where the number of of people being tested is also low, we can automatically come to the conclusion that, you know, that the number of cases are lower in those places, but that is by no means, you know, proven yet, and it remains to be seen. The second paper that you're talking about with the, in terms of the uh, race differences in the coronavirus virulence, this paper is not, has not been peer-reviewed and it has not been published. It has been uploaded to a preprint server uh, by the author. And I must credit the author for doing so because it puts the study into public view. But the author themselves claim that further work is required before they can come to any sort of conclusion as to the, that the strain is uh, less virulent in Indian. This study just looked at a few of the early cases um, and they looked at the genomic patterns of these cases. They There are a lot of methodological weak points in this, in this study and the authors themselves acknowledge that. Uh, the main ones are that there's no differentiation as to whether the, the samples they've taken from the various countries, whether they're, uh, what ethnicity they are. So for example, if they claim to take a sample from Wuhan, is it a Caucasian living in Wuhan or an Indian living in Wuhan or an Indian living in the USA? None of this data is recorded on their study. Second thing is, what they, the main point I took from their study is that the genome of the virus is similar um, in 99 plus percent of the cases uh, across the spectrum. And they are certainly not saying that it's completely uh, that it's different in Indians, um, and that's not the conclusion. I think we have to be careful uh, when we come up with such conclusions from very preliminary data. And uh, you know, uh, it remains to be seen as to whether this is the case. But certainly, we cannot come to that conclusion now. As someone who has also seen this situation in the UK, any mm -hmm. advice you would like to give to people back in India? So the main advice is don't take coronavirus as something that is not a serious problem. Coronavirus is a serious problem. We've not seen the likes of it for over 100 years since probably the Spanish flu pandemic. People are dying. To give you put this into context, in places such as Italy and Spain, on a daily basis for the past week, eight to 900 people have been dying. If you extrapolate that to one month, that's about a quarter. 200, 2 lakh to 2.5 lakh people dying in each of those countries. I'm glad that so far in India we're not seeing those sort of death rates and I hope that it continues that way and everybody has to play a part 
to keep it that way, and that is to maintain the lockdown, maintain social distancing. And the more people that participate in that, the less people that will die and the less this disease will spread and the less we'll see these terrible consequences. Thank you, Doctor, for speaking to us and explaining in detail the impact of the virus and how to deal with it. Thanks, Thank you.